Good morning, everybody. If you are able, let's stand together and sing our first hymn, which is in your pew hymnal 533, Children of God. We will sing verses 1, 3, and 4. look to your neighbor and offer a good morning, a hello, a wave, a high five. Good morning, friends. Good morning and welcome to Brea Congregational Church and happy Sunday. Whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Before we get started, we have a few announcements. Uh, the first is that on August 3rd, our church community will gather for the Brea Concert in the Park. Uh, a $20 donation will ensure that you get a seat under the Easy Up and a beverage and a snack. Uh, sounds like the Alley Cats will be singing hits from the 50s and 60s, and all you need to do is bring a blanket and a, or a chair. Um, if you have questions, you can see Sharon Burla. She'll give a little wave. <laughs> And along with that, another fundraiser that we're doing is we're doing a 50-50 drawing. You can see Sharon there in the back. We've got our two Sharons on duty. Um, and you can purchase some 50-50 tickets. And I believe the drawing will be the day of the concert. So you can support the church and have fun while doing it. I think that's all we've got on the announcement front. Um, so we'll, we'll proceed. Thich Nhat Hanh was a Vietnamese Buddhist monk, activist, teacher, and author, and he died earlier this year at the age of 95. Known as the father of mindfulness, he was instrumental in reaching both Buddhists and non-Buddhists with his approach to staying present in the now and embracing all that the current moment has to offer. He once said, Western civilization places so much emphasis on the idea of hope that we sacrifice the present moment. Hope is for the future. It cannot help us discover joy, peace, or enlightenment in the present moment. There is certainly a time and a place for hope for the future, but not at the expense of living in what is unfolding around us right now. 
And so as we enter into worship today, let us leave behind our worries about the past. Let us let go of our hopes for, and fears about the future and instead be fully present in this moment before us. Let us breathe deeply in and exhale with gratitude for what is around us as we begin our worship. You'll find your gathering song in the White Pew Songbook, and it is uh, number 13. Uh, on page 13, if you're able, let's stand together and sing, Come, My People. Come, my people, welcome to worship. Love is in the warmth of this place. Sing to God a song of thanksgiving. Sing to God a song of praise. Come, my people, welcome to worship. Love is in the warmth of this place. Sing to God a song of thanksgiving. Sing to God a song of praise. You may be seated. Please join me in the call to worship. We gather to worship together. Different people, different lives, different histories, yet all children of the same parent, created lovingly by the source of all life. We gather to reconnect with one another. Different people, different lives, different histories, yet all disciples of one teacher. The word made flesh, Christ dwelling among us. We gather with different joys and sorrows, different hopes and fears, different people, different lives, different histories, yet one people with one God, one faith, one calling. Let us open ourselves to the presence of God at work in us, among us, and through us. The special music slot is open for you all, if you want it. But I prepared something just in case, so. <laughs> um, this is a, I guess a mashup, if you will. Two songs, a contemporary and a traditional um, sacred hymn. The f contemporary one is Jesus, Draw Me Ever Nearer. The traditional one is Nearer My God to Thee. Um, one of the things that I have had to contend with growing up in the religious background that I did, is that getting closer to God and closer to Jesus does not mean getting further away from people um, and life, and that it comes together. So I'm able to now hear, and there's no words to this, it's piano only, but as you listen to it, and you hear those fami the familiar tune. I'm able to hear it with kind of different ears now than I did maybe 10 years ago, and I'm in a happier place, and that's many thanks to you all in this church too, so. There's a lot of trauma that I'm dealing through. <laughs>
Today's reading is from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. As they traveled, Jesus entered a village where a woman named Martha welcomed him to her home. She had a sister named Mary who seated herself at Jesus' feet and listened to his words. Martha, who was busy with all the details of hospitality, came to Jesus and said, Rabbi, don't you care that my sister has left me all alone in the kitchen with the household tasks? Tell her to help me. Jesus replied, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and upset about so many things, but only a few things are necessary. Really, only one. Mary has chosen the better part, and she won't be deprived of it. I invite our young people to come forward. Good morning, my friends. You all are so colorful this morning. I love it. Have any of you ever seen the movie Up? Yeah? Oh, wow, I'm so surprised. I think it came out before all of you were born. I was realizing that, that and it made me feel a little bit old. Um, so in the movie, as you already know, there's a man, right? You remember his name? Carl. Carl is a balloon artist and he makes balloons for people, right? And as he gets older, he is being taken out of his home, and he's upset, right? And so he takes all of those balloons, and what does he do to them? He puts them on the chimney on the top of the house to make the house fly away so he can go on his adventure that he's wanted to go on his entire life, right? And so he goes up into the sky with these balloons, and then what happens? He realizes someone's there, right? A Boy Scout is there on his porch. Do you remember his name? Russell, that's right. Russell's out on the porch, and he knocks on the door, right? He says, hi, Mr. Fredrickson, it's me, Russell. And Carl is just mortified that he has somehow gotten on, on his house up in the air, right? And so eventually they go on this adventure and they meet a few people along the way. They meet, they meet a talking dog. Yeah, we're gonna get there in a second. They meet, they meet a bird first, right? You remember the bird's name? Oh, they meet the dog first? Oh, you're so smart. I should have known better. So they meet, uh, well, let's, let's start with the bird. So they meet a bird, it may not be in the right order, but they meet a bird and the bird's name is, do you remember, Kevin? Kevin's a girl, but Kevin also has the name Kevin, which is awesome. Um, and then, you're right, they meet a talking dog named Doug. <laughs> you all know this so well. <laughs> they meet a talking dog named Doug who has this collar around his neck um, that makes him talk. You're right, like, like humans talk. Oh, Jessica, you are just on it. Um, so they're on their adventure, and they come across all these people, and they come across Doug and Doug's friends, other dogs, right? And do you remember what happens when the dogs see something off in the distance? Do you remember? What do they do? They're talking along, they're telling their story. Squirrel! <laughs> you remember that? They keep talking along, squirrel! They get so distracted by the squirrels. You've seen dogs like that in real life, right? Dogs that get distracted by squirrels or things moving. Yeah, you've seen that before? Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like you're plugging along, you're doing your thing, and then all of a sudden, oh, I'm distracted. I'm distracted by that. Yeah, might happen when you're doing your homework, or you're cleaning your room. <laughs> yeah, when you're reading, yeah, you get distracted by things. And that's okay, there are lots of things in the world that distract us, and sometimes they can be really exciting and good things. But there's also time where we need to just kind of focus, right? Focus on what we're doing, maybe focus on our relationship with God or the people around us. So Ms. Farron has over here a number of different things. You can each grab one, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. Somebody want to grab those especially. Yeah. 
cool. So um, each of you have a different item. These are called prayer beads. And then the rest of you have, what are they called, Aiden? Palm stones. So you actually put the stone in your hand, and you can use it as kind of a way to center you. So this, these prayer beads are used in all different kinds of religions, both in our religion, Christianity, but also in Buddhism and in a lot of different traditions. They use prayer beads, and what they do is as they're saying their prayers, you want to hold them up? As, as they're saying their prayers, they're moving their fingers over each bead as a way to kind of center themselves, to get them focused on the prayer that they're saying, right? And then eventually they get down there. That's pretty cool. Those are beautiful. And then for you all, you have all of your stones. So they put those, those, you can put that stone in your hand, and it can be kind of a physical way. Miss Aiden's going to show you. It can be kind of a physical way. You can touch it. You can move it around. It can be kind of a physical way for you to focus on the prayer or focus on the quiet time that you're having so that you might be a little bit less distracted by the squirrels or whatever. Sound like a good plan? So we're actually going to let you take those over to Sunday school and you can learn a little bit more about them and you can use them during your Sunday school lesson and in case maybe your mind is thinking about what you're going to eat after church or all the chores you have or whatever, you can just focus on your prayer beads or your stone and focus on what we're doing here at church. Sound like a good plan? Okay, let's have a prayer. God, sometimes we get distracted by things in the world and we ask you to draw our focus in, to remind us of your love, to remind us of the ways that you hold us and you care for us no matter what. And so as we go to Sunday school and as we go into this week, please remind our young folks that they are so very loved by you and by their church. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Have fun in Sunday school, okay? Right. Okay, our next hymn is in your pew hymnal, number 181. You are the salt for the earth, O people. Let's stand together if you're able. Let's sing verses 1, 2, and 4. <clears throat> You are the salt for the earth, O oh people, salt for the reign of God. Share the flavor of life, O oh people, life in the city of God. Bring forth the reign of mercy, bring forth the reign of peace, bring forth the reign of justice, bring forth the city of God. The light on the hill, O oh people, light for the city of God. Shine so holy and bright, O oh people, shine for the city of God. Bring forth the reign of mercy, bring forth the reign of peace, bring forth the reign of justice, bring forth the city of God. Blessed and a pilgrim people, bound for the reign of God. Love our journey and love our homeland. Love is the city of God. Bring forth the reign of mercy. Bring forth the reign of peace. Bring forth the reign of justice. Bring forth the city of God. You may be seated. I imagine that most of us have had roommates at some point in our lives. Maybe some of you have horror stories and others of you may have found some of your closest friends by living together with people who were total strangers before you met them. The stories about roommates are endless, and there are probably many stories I could share that would illustrate a sermon point in one way or another. But today, today's story is about my college roommate, Lena. 
Now, Lena is one of those friends who is always up for an adventure. When hypothetically asked, if your spouse called you from jail, who would they be there with? Omari, without hesitation, would say, Lena. <laughs> Luckily for us, we never ended up in jail uh, in our time living together, but there was no shortage of adventure. Going to college in Orange County, many of our classmates came from Southern California, but Lena was the outlier, being from Montana. She would talk about Montana daily. I mean, I would too if I grew up outside of the beauty of Glacier National Park. But she would tell us about the local musicians, the local beers, the lake sports in the summer and the snow sports in the winter. She would tell us about the hiking and her dog Huckleberry. Even though her childhood had its challenges, it was clear that she grew up in a place where she could be herself, make mistakes, and of course, as was evident by her personality, look for adventures everywhere she went. In the summer before our last year of college, I had the chance to go home with her to her beloved Whitefish, Montana. Our days there were packed with everything and nothing. Swimming in the river, picking huckleberries, playing with Huckleberry the dog, visiting farmers markets, hiking in Glacier, and certainly full days, but a visit in which I felt fully present to the beauty of the world around us. In our final year of college, every time Elena would mention something about Montana, I too would share in her joy. I too would almost be able to taste and feel and see and hear the experience that she was describing. When she said, in Montana, such and such, I knew exactly what that meant. It deepened our friendship, being able to connect with her in that way, but it also encouraged me to be present in ways I hadn't before. Every one of us needs those friends and experiences that force us to be present in the moment unfolding around us. And Lena has always been that friend to me. It is in those times of being fully present that we are most likely to connect with the divine through the earth, those around us, or just having enough quiet to listen to our still speaking God. When I think back to living with Lena, I certainly remember, remember the adventures, not many of which will probably ever make it into a sermon. But there's another memory that has come back to me several times over the past few months. Lena was extremely guided by the changing seasons. I think this was due in part to growing up in a place with all four seasons. But I used to get a good chuckle out of her telling me, oh no, that's a winter movie, or that song is a spring song, or I'll have this drink because it's fall. I suppose growing up in Southern California, I wasn't so much guided by the seasons. You can eat soup in spring. It's not that different than eating it in winter, right? I'll listen to that album in summer or in winter. It's good all year round. But lately, something has shifted within me in my constant and often futile endeavor to be more present, to be more connected to God and to the earth. I've recently found myself thinking about the things I'm doing in relation to the season. While looking for a TV show the other day, I came upon one and thought, Oh no, that's a fall TV show, not a summer TV show. I found myself chuckling aloud at the thought of it, but it really was true. It wasn't a summer show. And for those of us living in Southern California, the seasonal variation may not be as stark as in a place like Montana, but it does make me wonder if maybe I just missed my ability to be connected to the seasons not that they didn't matter at all. When I was able to be more fully present, I was opened up to the things that were there all along, but I was too busy to notice. What other things can we say that have been there all along, but we've just been too busy to notice them? Our scriptural text that Michelle read this morning tells the story of Jesus going to the home of Mary and Martha. 
Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus, who appears in other parts of our scripture as well, are friends of Jesus. They decide to open up their home to Jesus and his disciples as a place where they might gather and eat and teach others. The story is accounted for in both this, the gospel according to Luke, but also in John's gospel. In John's gospel, we get more information. As Martha serves, Mary anoints Jesus' feet with perfume and wipes his feet with her hair, and Lazarus reclines at the table with Jesus. But back to Luke's version. It comes on the heels of our story from last week, Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan. The author knows that the intended audience will already be shocked by Jesus' assertion that the Samaritan could possibly be the epitome of what they are called to do and be. And Luke's author builds on this shock by sharing the story of Mary and Martha. Now Jesus' teachings and parables to this point have often been centered around hospitality. And so, as the story is unfolding, as we learn that Martha is in the kitchen tending to the details of hospitality, likely cooking and cleaning, we are presented with the conflict that Jesus will attempt to mediate. Martha is caring for the people in their home, while Mary sits at Jesus' feet, listening to him and absorbing his every word as he teaches the people. Martha, most assuredly upset that she is once again in the other room working while the men gather in the main room with Jesus, realizes that her sister is not with her, but instead listening to Jesus' teachings. Maybe there's even something within Martha that wishes she too could be in the main room, but at the very least she is confident that her sister should join her in the work of the house. When she tells Jesus of her concerns, the reader might wonder, what is Jesus' take on this? Of course, there are many gender implications here, but at the core of the conflict, the reader may ask, will Jesus tell Mary to get into the kitchen and help her sister, or will he allow her to stay and listen to him? If you're working under the assumption that our highest calling is to serve others, then you might assume he will tell her, yes, go help your sister. But Jesus once again surprises the reader by telling Mary, Martha that Mary is also fulfilling her duties as a follower of his. In traditional interpretations of this passage, we often hear this as an indictment against Martha, that she should have known better than to question her sister's desire to sit and listen to the Christ, and subsequently that the hearer of this story should also not concern themselves with serving others, but instead focus on their own learning and betterment and personal relationship with Christ. But I think that's a misguided lesson to take from this story, because so many of Jesus' teachings instruct us to care for one another. And in fact, Martha is doing just that by being hospitable to those in her home. Instead of seeing either Mary or Martha as wrong, or not following instructions of a faithful life, what if we can see this story as another reminder to be fully present in all that we do? What if Jesus wasn't telling Martha that she was wrong to be focused on serving others, but rather that she might learn from her sister how to be present and engaged in expressions of faith? Maybe it's less about what each woman is doing and more about the ways in which they are doing it. Martha is more consumed by worrying about her sister than she is being fully present in her service to others. And Mary, on the other hand, sits at Jesus' feet, fully captivated and engaged by his teachings. Time after time in our scripture, we are reminded that we are called to care for one another. But maybe this passage reminds us that we are also called to invest in our own learnings and our own deepenings of faith. Maybe Jesus' message here is that they are both necessary expressions of following him, but in doing so, we must be fully attuned to the actions of our faith. 
It's a refreshing notion to think that Jesus advocates both for care of others and care for ourselves, a balance that progressive Christians and people all over the world constantly have to balance. It's an empowering idea that the real call is to be present fully in our faithful expressions, whether we are serving the world or we are bettering our own selves through learning and reflection. This time of year, when the weather forecast hits the mid-90s, I start wishing for cooler weather, for sweaters and warm drinks, and maybe even that TV show that is only acceptable to watch in the fall. But instead of rushing to what is next, I think I might just be present in this beautiful summer weather. I might take a play out of Lena's book and be fully present in this season, both literally and metaphorically. I may enjoy the beach and the warm sun on my skin and walks outdoors without having to grab a sweater. I may enjoy cool iced drinks and swimming in the pool and the long days where I don't get sleepy by 6 o'clock p.m. Because I imagine that the more present we are, the more we might be open to the things that were there all along, but we missed because we were too focused on what was next or what someone else was doing in the other room. This world is full of things that draw us away from the present moment. Our phones and our worries and our obsession with buying more and more. But divine energy is constantly pulling us instead into this very minute, this very second, this very breath. May we only be quiet enough and focused enough to experience it all and all of the beauty that this particular season has to offer us. Amen and blessed be. Please join me in prayer. Holy Creator, even amidst the storms that cover our lives, we are so grateful for you. So grateful that you hold us together when we cannot hold ourselves. God, we thank you for the good things happening in our world. We thank you for those writing beautiful poetry, for the leaders who truly care, for the people who will always help their neighbor. We see your beauty as we see new images taken by NASA's James Webb Space Telescope and are enamored by your beautiful creation. We know that at times it feels like there is no hope, that there is no good in the world, but oh, how we see the good in the person who brought us food when we were hungry, for the friend who thought to call, for the stranger who picked us up when we fell down on the sidewalk. We see the good, and we see your face in the faces of all the friends and strangers who choose to do good, and for that we are thankful. While we see the good, we also see a hurting world that is in need of your good, God. For those receiving horribly negative effects of the police crackdown on hundreds of protesters in China, for those suffering, we pray for your peace. We pray for the people of Sri Lanka after two leaders pledged to resign over the weekend amid mass protests, which saw demonstrators storm the presidential residence. As lawmakers form a new government, we pray that all people might be cared for and soon will have a peaceful place in which to live. We continue to pray for all the people in Ukraine after at least 15 people were killed Dozens more believed to be trapped in the rubble after a Russian missile strike in a residential neighborhood in eastern Ukraine. We pray that those of us outside Ukraine will remember that the war continues to be fought, and we are still to pr pray and support those who are suffering. God, we pray for the people of Japan after the assassination of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. We pray for healing for the whole country as they undergo change and grieve this loss. We pray for stability. 
And we know that there is so much change, so much violence, and so much hurt that we cannot bear. And that's why we ask that you might help us bear it all. That we will find a way to see the good in the world and be the good when no one else can be. Grant us hope that there is still good out there even when it is dim and we cannot see it ourselves. May we continue to open our eyes to a new world which holds people who are not only looking out for themselves, but also have chosen to offer their hand to care for others. Help us to be that change, to be those change makers, as we are also held by you and the goodness that only you can give. God, as we pray for the world around us, we also lift up those in our own community who need our prayers this day. We lift up Bernie and Dick and Bill and Joe and Chris. We lift up all of those who are not spoken aloud but who remain close to our hearts this day. God, as we pray to you, we now join in one voice praying Our Creator, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Peace be to you in all you do. Peace be the way in all you say. Peace be the light that shines so bright from your heart on the world this day. Let us be a resting place for each other's woes, offering spaces of restoration and ease. Let us be a connecting place for each other's creativity, offering to each other joy and play. Let us collect our shared resources for the day, offering each other compassion and mutuality. For together, we unfold the vibrant kingdom of God. Our ushers will come forward to collect our offerings and our gifts this day.
from all that dwell below the skies. Let songs of hope and faith arise. Let peace, good will on earth be sung through every land by every tongue. Amen. Please join me in the prayer of dedication. We dedicate our lives and all that we have to the work of life, of love, of peace. Receive our gifts and lead us in wisdom and courage. Amen. You'll find the text for the closing hymn on the back, the last page of your bulletin, I'm gonna live so God can use me. I'm gonna live so God can use me anytime, Lord, and anywhere. I'm gonna live so God can use me anytime, Lord, and anywhere. I'm gonna pray so God can use me anytime, Lord, and anywhere. I'm going to pray so God can use me anytime, Lord, and anywhere. I'm going to sing so God can use me anytime, Lord, and anywhere. I'm going to sing so God can use me anytime, Lord, and anywhere. I'm going to live so God can use me anytime, Lord, and anywhere. I'm gonna live so God can use me anytime, Lord, and anywhere. Anytime, Lord, and anywhere. Please join me in the commission and blessing. As we go, May we make known the wonders of God. May we share the hope of God and spread the love of God to all we meet. The grace of God will sustain and guide us. The glory of God will propel us. Amen. May the loving spirit of God go before you to guide you, beside you to guard you, beneath you to uphold you, above you to bless you, and behind you to forgive you, both now and forevermore. Amen, and go in peace.